Well, hello everybody. Brian Kelson with you again. And uh, the Lord bless you as you continue to search and see. Don't take it from me, remember. Um, and don't please stand before the Lord and say, well, Brian Kelson told me that. <laughs> um, one of the greatest uh, tools in learning, as we know, is the trash can. And it's very, very difficult uh, to unlearn things that have had such an important part of our life. Uh, and I do understand that. Trust me, raise Salvation Army and Baptist. Uh, you've heard me say on a few occasions that there came a time in the Salvation Army when I got, went to the officer and said, I can't believe number four of the articles of faith anymore because I've been studying my Bible. And he said, I don't believe that one either. And many of us don't, so don't worry about it. It's not important. Words are not important. Unfortunately, I have learned that words are very, very important, aren't they? And especially, my friends, the words of the Apostle Paul, and that's what we're comparing. You know that I'm pretty... Um, uh, strongly opposed to Romans through Philemon and I think you're beginning to understand that it is really a dispensational disaster that in fact Romans through Philemon is um, the cause of much confusion and misunderstanding and instead of clarifying the present dispensation of the grace of God given to Paul by revelation after Israel was set aside at Acts 28 uh, it uh, is a constant source of confusion explanation pulling this verse out of context to explain another verse which is already out of context but we leave that for the moment and we just realize that we're all students of the word and we want to come to the full knowledge of the truth to acknowledge the truth and to live by it now um, I haven't been as busy and uh, thank you for your patience in this matter um, Hurricane Helene has caused devastation and our prayers constantly go up for those who have suffered. That was followed by Hurricane Milton that went over the top of the property where I reside. And um, I maintain this property and it's up to me to keep it clean and I still have yet to even begun to make um, um, a dent in the huge branches that have been uh, blown down from the oak trees here. So I just wanted to give you an update as to why things are a little slow. Um, speaking of a little slow, I'm not as fast as I used to be and using chainsaws and throwing big branches onto trucks and dumping them is, um, you know, not, uh, not something that I can do with a lot of rapidity nowadays. So uh, just bear with me and uh, we will get that book finished. I'm working on it. I have done quite a bit this week and uh, I know many of you are patiently waiting for the latest edition and I believe that it is indeed uh, worth the wait. Now then, last video, to recap, we looked at Peter's statement in Acts 15 and just to refresh your memory, a couple of verses. Um, he said that God made choice a good long while ago uh, for me to um, speak to the Gentiles by my mouth and hear the word of the gospel and believe. And he says in verse 8 and 9, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. Remember, the Spirit was a confirmation. The word was confirmed. And uh, Cornelius heard and believed. And before Peter could water baptize him, the Spirit was given to him and those in his house. Verse 9 of Acts 15, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Twice Peter has spoken about the heart. And remember the context of Acts 15 is the Judaizers who wanted the Gentiles to keep the law to be saved. And finally in verse 11, Peter says, But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. So what I wanted to do today, um, just briefly, was to see some of the words of Paul uh, and some of the words of the writer of Hebrews and compare them. 
I know uh, many of our mid-ex brethren don't like that exercise. I didn't say Paul wrote Hebrews. I'm just saying that whether we like Hebrews or not, the fact remains that the rewriter of Hebrews is using many of the same Old Testament quotes that Paul is using in the Acts period and much uh, of the same themes and warnings particularly that Paul gives to the Corinthians, for example, can be found in the letter to the Hebrews. But I just want to refresh our memories about Cornelius. Remember, he was a just man, a good man. He gave arms to the poor. He was of good report. He was accepted by God and none of those qualities saved him. He was told to call for Peter who would give him words whereby he and his house would be saved. Cornelius was not partially saved because he was accepted by God. Cornelius wasn't partially saved because he did good works. Pete, uh, Cornelius wasn't partially saved because he gave arms to the poor. You know, there's a great gospel message in Cornelius, isn't there? A good man, better than many, uh, helping all, all those around him, and, uh, but works never saved Cornelius, they, just as they don't save anybody today. Well, we've already read Peter in Acts 15, haven't we? Okay, so now we've got statements in the scriptures, whether we like to accept them or not, that Jews and Gentiles in the Acts period, under the ministry of Peter or under the ministry of the Apostle Paul, was saved by the faith that they expressed in Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, according to the scriptures, buried, according to the scriptures, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And that's the gospel that Peter preached to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Now, here's the problem. We see the word grace and we think we, that it's synonymous with security of life in the Acts period. And it isn't. The more we read the Apostle Paul in the Acts period, we find that he is encouraging them to cleanse their work, to come out and be separate, he wrote in 2 Corinthians, to be careful about how they took communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at what Paul is writing. And Paul is writing very carefully to this group of uh, Jews predominantly at Corinth and Gentiles and telling them, hey, listen, I don't want you to be ignorant. All our fathers were under the cloud and all, under, and all um, passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That's a spirit baptism, um, brethren, not a water baptism by the Red Sea because they went through dry shod and it's not a water baptism in Jordan because they went through dry shod. This is a baptism by the Spirit into Christ in the Acts period. They were identified with Christ in the Acts period by their faith in his death, burial and resurrection. They all ate of that same spiritual meat and, all, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. We're talking about the sustenance and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that were upon both Jews and Gentiles in the Acts period when they exhibited faith in Christ. But with many of them, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 5, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Oh, they were all baptized into Moses. They all drank of that spiritual meat and water. But many of them, God, they displeased and they provoked God to jealousy. Peter talks about wrong. Stephen talks about this in Acts chapter 7. He says in verse 6, Now these things were examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, 
Now all these things happen unto them for examples. That's twice he said it. Why is the Apostle Paul warning the Corinthians by going back to the Exodus and the 40 years wilderness wandering? Because much and all as they had believed into Christ, notwithstanding that they had received the supernatural gift, sinning under the dispensation that existed in the Acts period, that is willfully sinning, brought serious consequences. And those serious consequences do not exist today in the dispensation of the grace of God, which is the mystery given to Paul after Israel was set aside at Acts 28. Can you see Israel in 1 Corinthians 10, that nation being brought out? Paul is warning the members of the elect remnant of grace, this is not the church which is his body he's writing to here, that they need to be very, very careful. And I have spoken to before, and in these short videos, I don't have a lot of time because you know the scriptures and I refer them to you and you go look at them. But in the very next chapter, I need to do this part anyway, he said, look, he said, I declare unto you that which I also received. Oh, I beg your pardon. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of, this, of me. He then took the cup. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore? Whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Anyone partaking of this Passover meal, commonly called communion, and doing it unworthily is guilty of the blood and um, body of the Lord. Do you think that exists today in the dispensation of the grace of God? Of course it doesn't. And this Passover meal, look forward to his coming, not his appearing, which is the hope of us today in the dispensation of the grace of God. Verse 28, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation or judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is not the church which is his body. For this cause, i.e., because you have not examined yourself, because you have not looked at how the motivation of your actions, for this cause, many are weak and sickly and money, and many are dead. Sleep is the word. Do you think that, in 1 Corinthians 11, having been warned in 1 Corinthians, do you really think this is the church which is his body is writing to? Absolutely not. Do you think the dispensation of the grace of God is in operation when Corinthians was written, when many of them were being judged by the Lord? You see, oh, I should have read the next two verses as usual. Verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 11, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. <laughs> judge yourself or the Lord is going to judge you. Now, are they eternally secure? <laughs> yes, I believe they are. All Israel will be saved. But what they're going to do is they're going to be like Esau and disregard something that was very, very important and privileged to them. So I want to jump over to the writer of Hebrews. You know, I'm going to argue as to whether Paul wrote Hebrews. It doesn't matter. The writer of Hebrews is using exact same casting back to the past as a warning. So let's jump over to Hebrews and look at, if I can find it, Hebrews. And what was the chapter am I going to read? I think I'm reading three. Now, 
Wherefore, say in verse 7 of chapter 3, as the Holy Ghost says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now, don't think Paul's writing to Israel, be, oh, sorry, whoever's writing Hebrews, because the next verse 12 says, Take heed, brethren. It's writing to Jewish believers. Lest there be any in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Departing from the God who has manifested his Son, who has demonstrated confirmation of faith with supernatural gifts. Don't depart. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginnings of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Oh, what does it mean, partakers of the of the um, of Christ? It means partaking in all the glory and reigning and all the honor of meeting Him in the clouds as He descends. Chapter six. If I can. Just look at it. I haven't got my best glasses on here. He says, we must leave away the basic elements in chapter 6. He said in verse 4, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. What's that about? That's talking about the supernatural gifts, the very supernatural gifts that fell on Cornelius when God who knows the hearts purified the heart and gave him the gift. He was saved when he received the gifts, not before. Verse 5, And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, depart from the living God, falling away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Oh, 1 Corinthians 11, guilty of the blood and body, here putting Christ to an open shame. Does there seem to be a similarity there? Now, what is this repentance? This repentance, I don't believe, is the repentance of John the Baptist to be saved or to have faith. It's the repentance of actually departing from the living of God or falling away. You can't get back and find this repentance to reclaim that glory that was yours if you endured to the end in the Acts period. He says in verse 9, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Things that accompany salvation. The repentance they couldn't find was to the things that accompany salvation, not the salvation itself. For God is not unrighteous, verse 10, to forget your work and labor of love. And we desire that every one of you does show the same diligence of the full assurance of hope unto the end. So it's continuing in faith unto the end. What is the end? Well, I'm going to jump over to chapter 10. Now, it says down here in about, tw I think I'm going to go verse... Uh, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Do you know what? Some people say, well, we should be going to church all the time. This word only occurs twice in the New Testament, and it occurs in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, what Paul is saying here is... Not, do not forsake the meeting in the clouds. That is what the assembling of themselves together is. Hebrews in the Acts period, pursuing to the end. The end in view was that imminent return of Christ, who in Hebrews has been raised to the Father's right hand as king and as Israel's high priest. So when Christ comes back in the clouds and people go up to meet him, he is not coming back as the head of the church, which is his body. He's coming back as Israel's king and Israel's high priest. That's the 
title and rank and office that Christ holds when he comes back in the clouds. And those folks go to meet him. You won't be meeting him and I won't be meeting him. We're going to the appearing in glory where he is head of the church, which is his body. And here in Corinthians and Hebrews, there is a risk that they could lose the sharing of the glory by willfully sinning, by departing, by forsaking, by falling away. Verse 26, for if we willfully, uh, if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a cer certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation. What did Paul write in 1 Corinthians 11? We must judge ourselves or Christ will judge us. So, Hebrews is looking for that same judgment. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy unto two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace, the Spirit that gave them the gifts. Do you see the difference in the Acts period and the post-Acts period? Now I had some more things to say, but I've run out of time as usual. So I want you to think. Romans through Philemon mixes all those warnings and judgments that were falling on the believers in the Acts period with a pure and gracious dispensation of the mystery which is in operation today. And you and I are not judged. We are not looking fearfully. We don't tread underfoot the Son of God. None of those things, my friend, apply to us. They apply to the believers in the Acts period. And we need to rightly divide Paul whether he wrote Hebrews or not. It's in harmony with Corinthians. And therefore, these things help to show us the differences in Paul. Romans 3 Philemon is not just a disaster. It's a dispensational disaster. And it misleads and misguides people to the present set of conditions. Thank you. God bless you as you search and see.